Chapters 13 and 14, Regression Lesson starts off with a review of where Biz 230 left off. First, I will talk about how the regression line was formulated. Then, I will demonstrate how Excel can be used to achieve the same results, but much faster. You will recall that a cumbersome number of formula were used to calculate um, and generate the linear regression equation. Remember, the linear regression equation is y prime equals a plus b times x. a is the intercept, or the value of y prime, the value that we're attempting to forecast, when x is 0. b is the slope of the line, or by how much y prime changes for every one unit change in x. We call y the dependent variable. x is the independent variable. Correlation relates to the value of the slope. When b is positive, there is a positive correlation, and the prediction line is upward sloping. When b is negative, there is a negative correlation, and the prediction line is downward sloping. If the line is horizontal or vertical, then there is said to be no correlation. Before drawing the regression formula, or calculating the regression formula, you could produce a scatter diagram. Here we have three scatter diagrams depicting x-y coordinates for three data sets. For each diagram, you could manually draw a line through the data points, which minimizes the dispersion between each point and the line. Said another way, draw a line which best describes the relationship between x and y. For the scatter diagram in the middle, notice the red downward sloping line better fits the data than an upward sloping line. The right-hand diagram would be better described by an upward sloping line. Notice that the xy coordinates in the right-hand diagram are closer together when compared to the middle diagram. This suggests that there's a stronger positive correlation while the middle plot is a weaker negative correlation. For the diagram on the left, a vertical line, just as easily as a horizontal line, could be used to describe the data. Here, we would conclude there's no correlation. Rather than relying on subjective analysis of the data, we can calculate the correlation coefficient using the formula on the screen. We did this in Biz 230. The correlation coefficient is uh, denoted by small r. Recall the correlation coefficient can range from a negative 1, which is perfect negative correlation, to positive 1, which is perfect positive correlation. The closer the value is to 0, the more likely there is no correlation. In this case, we would not build a regression equation. When we square the correlation coefficient, we get the coefficient of determination. The coefficient of determination tells us how much of the variation in y can be explained by the variation in x. A good model is one which has an r squared greater than 80%. Said another way, 80% of the variation in y can be explained by the variation in x. In Table 13-1 of the text, data regarding sales contacts made by salespeople and the volume of copiers they sold is presented. We will use this information to build a model which forecasts volume of copiers sold. Since we are forecasting the number of copiers sold, this is our dependent variable. 
the independent variable is number of sales contacts. So in the table on the screen, the first column of the table is the X variable, the second column is Y. Using the correlation formula on the previous screen, one finds that the correlation is 0.759, which su suggests a, re a relatively strong positive correlation and a coefficient of determination of 0.576, meaning that about 58% of the variation is um, in number of copiers sold can be explained by the number of contacts. Said another way, 42% is unexplained. Consequently, we would conclude that number of sales contacts on its own is not a good predictor of number of copiers sold. In fact, statistically, can we even be sure that at 0.759 there even is a positive correlation? Before we proceed to building a regression model, we did a t-test to confirm correlation. If statistically we found the correlation to be not significantly different from zero, then we would not proceed to calculating the regression equation. Here we're testing um, the hypothesis that rho is equal to zero. Notice the null hypothesis is rho equals zero. Our alternate hypothesis then would be that rho is not equal to zero, so we want to be able to reject our null hypothesis. In the textbook, the test statistic was calculated to be 3.30. It's in the rejection region beyond our critical value of 2.306. We thus can conclude that statistically correlation exists. And we would proceed, we could proceed with building a regression model. Later, we would build a confidence interval around its estimate. Because the coefficient of determination is so low, what we end up with is a very wide range of um, possible values for y uh, in our forecast model. So based on the t-test, we concluded that statistically correlation existed between x and y. We can now start to build the regression line. Previously we used a very cumbersome set of formula to generate the intercept and slope values. Here we are able to generate a value for the slope and the intercept using a correlation coefficient based formula. Both sets of formulas get us to the same values for the slope and the intercept. The calculated values using the formula on this screen give us a value of 1.184 for the slope or the B coefficient and 18.9476 for the intercept or A coefficient. This again is based on that correlation coefficient of 0.759. Write down these values somewhere. We'll be using them to compare to the values generated by Excel. In this portion of the lecture, I will demonstrate how to use the Excel regression tool in the Data Analysis Toolkit. If data analysis does not appear on your spreadsheet's data tab, notice here the data tab, data analysis, you'll need to add it in as we've done in class or previously for uh, some of our hypothesis testing. If you do not recall how to add in data analysis, please refer to the instructions posted in D2L.
So the first thing you will need to do is open up this sales versus calls spreadsheet again found in D2L. The first thing you'll notice is that the spreadsheet contains the data we were working with previously in order to calculate the correlation coefficient and the values for the intercept and the slope. Again, this is the same data that's found in Table 13-1 in the textbook. Next to the data, you'll find a summary output table. This is what we're going to generate using Data Analysis Toolkit. Before we discuss this content in the summary output, I will demonstrate how to generate the summary output. Step one is to select the data tab and then data analysis. So you want to click on data analysis. Next, from the menu, select regression. So we're going to scroll down, find regression, and then click on OK. Now you need to tell Excel what you are actually going to be regressing. So you have to identify the Y variable and the X variable. The Y range is the dependent variable which has been identified as sales. Here you will sell reference C1 to C11. Notice I have included the label for the data. So to be sure to check the labels box within this screen. The X range is the independent variable, calls. Here we will reference, being sure to keep your, your cursor in the X range window. Next, you need to select a level of confidence. At this point, we'll assume it's 95%. This is the level of confidence that's going to be related to um, the hypothesis test for correlation. Lastly, select an output range. Here, being sure to make sure, being sure to put your cursor in the output range window. Choose F24 as your output range. And we'll click OK and then we'll demonstrate, if you've done it correctly, that you get the exact same values that are generated above. So what does the summary table give us, or the summary output table give us? It gives us all the information we previously generated by hand calculations. These are all the highlighted values in yellow. So in cell G5, we have the correlation coefficient. Notice it's 0.759. Compare that to the number that you calculated by hand. In G6, we get the R squared, or the coefficient of determination. In G18, we get the intercept value, and in G19, we get the value for the slope. Again, compare those to the values you wrote down from the previous screen, and you'll notice that they're identical. In cells K19 and L19, we get the confidence interval for the slope values. Recall that previously we had calculated a t-test statistic, compared that to a critical value to determine whether correlation was 
statistically significant. Now we're going to check the confidence interval and as long as the confidence interval does not trap zero, it means that there is correlation between X and Y. In this case, the true value of the slope is somewhere between 0.356 and 2.012. Notice zero is not within that range of values. So we say that there's enough evidence to conclude that there's a positive correlation. If instead this value was a negative 0.356 and this was still a positive 2.012, then we would have a situation where the confidence interval included zero or trap zero in which case we could not be sure whether there was a negative co uh, correlation or a positive correlation or no correlation at all. The model would then not be usable. So we've generated a model in Excel. What does it tell us? Well, it gives us a forecasting model for sales based on the number of sales contacts that were made. So the model again is sales equals 18.95 plus 1.184 times the number of contacts made. So how many copiers could we expect a salesperson to sell based on, let's assume, 25 contacts? Multiplying 25 times 1.184, then adding 18.95, we get sales equal to 48.55 or we would expect that sales person to sell 48 copiers. We round it down because we're talking about discrete data. Now it's time to test your understanding of the lesson so far. Posted in D2L, are a number of spreadsheet exercises with solutions. The first spreadsheet is one that contains real estate data. Here you will analyze the price and the size of the home sold. In the spreadsheet, answers to the questions on the screen are highlighted and color-coded on the spreadsheet. The last question highlighted is in orange. It relates to constructing confidence intervals. Disregard this for now. We will discuss this in the next segment of the lecture. Note, once you open the spreadsheet, you want to use the first tab of the spreadsheet. After opening the spreadsheet, you should see the information on this screen. Notice we've got the questions highlighted here and color-coded. So the first question that uh, we are going to ask is which is the dependent variable? Highlighted in pink here, we've got a choice between price and size. So price is expressed in thousands of dollars, size is the square footage of the home. I know that size is the independent variable. Notice size here is reported in the output table and we get an X coefficient for size. So that means that price must be our dependent variable. Is this a good model? Well, we look at the coefficient of determination. Here it's quite low. Remember, we're looking for something of 0.8 or higher in order to be considered a strong model. Is there positive or negative correlation? And is the X coefficient reliable? Well, now we're looking at the confidence interval for the X coefficient. This tells us that the X coefficient could be anything between 0 0.035 and 0 0.104666. As long as this doesn't trap zero, it means that the correlation is different from zero. So here we see that there's a positive point 0.70289 as the x coefficient. 
this doesn't trap zero so we can be sure that there is positive correlation between size and price and again intuitively that makes sense describing the model well the model is the equation so here we're taking the intercept of 64.79 plus 0 0.070 and I rounded it here 3 times whatever x is so if we want to estimate what the price would be for a home that was 2200 square feet in size we would substitute 2200 into the equation and we'd get 219.45 as our point estimate or said another way $219,450 would be our expected selling price for a home that was 2200 square feet in size. Here are two more practice problems from chapter 13 to try in your own. Again, spreadsheets with solutions are posted in D2L. Disregard again the information related to confidence interval calculations. We will discuss this in the next segment. Notice you will be you you're assigned exercise 50 and 51 again in chapter 13. In this segment of the lecture, we will begin to calculate confidence intervals for the predicted value of y. Up till now, we've used the model to predict the dependent variable y. Keep in mind this is just a point estimate. It is highly unlikely the predicted value will actually match this value. However, we can estimate a range of values between which the actual value will fall. When r square is high, that is 0 0.80 or more, the tighter the confidence interval will be, indicating that it is a better model. Recalling the model previously built based on sales and sales contacts, we can now build a confidence interval around the estimated number of copies sold. You'll recall previously that we estimated the sales volume for a salesperson who made 25 contacts. We found that the predicted value or the predicted number of sales or the predicted number of copiers sold would have been 48.552. Using the equation 1310 in your textbook, we can build a confidence interval y prime is what we've predicted 48.552 we are going to add a margin of error around that point estimate by calculating this part of the equation so t is pulled from the t table it's based on a level of confidence in this case we're going to use 95 percent and degrees of freedom identified by n minus 2 where n is the number of paired observations this value here is the standard error the standard error will be pulled from the regression output next part of the equation these values here will be square rooted the first uh, term that we see again is 1 divided by n where n is the number of paired observations we're going to add to that this value which is, is appears in parentheses the numerator of that value is x minus x bar so x is the x we use to predict y x bar will be calculated in Excel We'll square that value and then we're going to divide by the summation of all the x's subtracted for, uh, subtracting the average value for x, squaring that. So now we're going to return to the sales versus calls file 
in Excel and we'll calculate this confidence interval for 48.552. So once you've opened up the sales versus calls spreadsheet again, uh, be sure to be in the second tab. Um, you'll notice at the bottom CI for confidence interval and you should get the information which appears on the screen here. In cell F23, the confidence interval here is calculated. So we highlight it in green here. So again, we start with our predicted value of y, which was 48.552. The next value uh, that we need to insert into our equation, 2.306, is the t value associated with a 95% confidence interval and 8 degrees of freedom. 8 degrees of freedom because it's based on n minus 2. n here is the number of paired observations, in this case 10. That is, if you counted here, we have 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 10 paired observations. The next term, 9.900824, is the standard error. Notice it's found in the summary output used to build our confidence interval around the estimate. Next in the formula, we've got the square root sign over this entire part of the uh, values in parentheses. The first term is 1 over n, which again we've already identified to be 10. Then we're adding to that the value 25 minus 22. Again, 25 is the x value we use to predict y. 22 is the average. The average is found here in cell B12. We've averaged the number of calls. 25 minus 22 squared is our numerator. We're dividing that by 760, which is the summation of each of the x's subtracted from the average and squared. So how did I get these values? I took b15, which was the x value of 20, subtracted that from 22, and then squared that. Copied all those that formula down here and then summed that range of values in C15 through C24 and got my 760. So now I've got a margin of error of plus or minus 7.365 copiers. So my confidence interval now is 41.187 to 55.917. So I'm 95% confident that a salesperson who makes 25 calls will sell anywhere between 42 copiers. Notice it's discrete variables here. So 41 isn't in the confidence interval. So 42 to 55. Again, normal rounding, you would round this up to 56, but the confidence interval doesn't include 56. So in discrete data terms, it's somewhere between 42 and 55 copiers. Now I'd like you to return to the spreadsheet which contains the real estate data. Be sure to click on the second tab of this spreadsheet. Again, all of the questions posted on the screen are answered in the spreadsheet. Notice that we are now talking about analyzing the price of a home versus its distance from the center of town. We are going to estimate the sale price of a home located 20 miles from the center of town, and then we're going to build a confidence interval around that estimate. So here again we see our standard checklist of items that we will analyze whenever we have a regression output. So first question, which is the dependent variable? So again, I go to the summary output, I see distance, 
listed in the ANOVA table here. Um, so distance is my independent variable. I'm using it to predict price. Is this a good model? Well, the first thing I look at is the R square. So again, 0 0.1204, very low, not a good model. We'd say that this is a weak model. Is there positive or negative correlation? And is the X coefficient reliable? Well, we look at the confidence interval here. The range of values for the X coefficient is anything between a negative 5.125 to a negative 1.5827. Again, this confidence interval does not trap zero, does not include zero, meaning that we can be sure that the X coefficient is reliably, the correlation is reliably different than zero. And in this case, because we've got a negative sign in front of that coefficient, we know that there's negative correlation. Again, intuitively, that makes sense. Typically, the further out from the center of town a home is, uh, the lower the price. So we're going to describe the model, build the regression equation here. So looking at uh, our intercept and then our x coefficient. So I can now predict price based on this equation or this model. If I was interested in predicting the price of a home located 20 miles from the center of town, I would substitute 20 into the equation and I'd find that my predicted value would be 203.087 or because we're talking about thousands of dollars again here in price, we would expect a home located 20 miles from the center of town to sell for $203,087. Again, that's just a point estimate. We're going to build a confidence interval around that estimate. So. Um, in order to do that, we have to, again, fulfill the equation. So 203.087 is my predicted value of y. My t value here is based on 95% um, confidence. And n, in this case, is 105 paired observations. So 103 is my uh, degrees of freedom. Now, if you don't have a t-table that um, actually has 105 degrees of freedom or 103 degrees of freedom, go ahead and use the 100 degrees of freedom. You'll notice that t does not change by very much um, once the number of observations gets quite large. The next term I'm looking for is the standard error, 44.39, coming again from the summary output here. And now I'm going to take the square root of the terms here in parentheses. First term is 1 over n, in this case again, 105 paired observations, plus. Now the next term, I've got to calculate a numerator here based on x minus x bar. So x again is the x that was used to predict y, in this case 20. x bar is 14.63, so I've taken the average of all of the values in column B. You'll notice here, calculated the average to be 14.63. Substituting that into the enumerator and then squaring it and then dividing it by the summation of the x minus x bar squared. So here, again, I'm taking each of the x values, here we've got uh, cell B3 minus 14.63, squaring that, copying that formula down, and then taking the summation of all those values, I get 2470.515. Calculating that entire margin of error, I get plus or minus 12.82. So 203.8, 
or 203.87 plus or minus 12.82 gives me a range of values of 191.05 to 216.69. Or said another way, a home that's located 20 miles from the center of town will sell between $191,050 and $216,690. Returning to the spreadsheets for exercises 50 and 51 in Chapter 13, now construct confidence intervals uh, as instructed on this screen. Again, the solutions for the 95% confidence intervals for exercises 50 and 51 are found in the spreadsheet posted on D2L. This now concludes our discussion of linear regression, that is chapter 13. Um, we will now start our second portion of regression and that relates to chapter 14 or multiple regression. Thank you.